Yeah, so I would like to thank uh, Timo and the other organizers to, um, to invite me here. Uh, and like Hendrik here, I'm not super strong in the prefrontal cortex. I will touch upon it, but uh, there will also be some visual cortex, apologies. Um, so when I started to do neuroscience, I wanted to measure real, measurable things. So I thought I'd stay out of uh, visual attention, but at some point it, it caught me. So I talked about the A word, but at some point it happened. And today I kind of made <laughs> the next step. So now it's the C word, C for consciousness. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll first talk a little bit about uh, some of the background on feed forward and feedback processing, but I don't have a lot of time, so I'll, I'll go quickly there. And then I'll focus on, on the neural correlates of visual awareness. Um, now this is a picture I like to show for an introduction. So if you see a picture like this, right, there's so much information and still our visual system is quite adept in, in, in processing this image in spite of the fact that its receptive fields, especially at low levels, are very small. So at first sight, these neurons seem to be carrying only about s small fragments of the image. So image, really, image processing really starts with fragmentation, but that's, that's not how we see. We don't have a hard time to see that this and this is part of the same zebra. So something needs to put those pieces back together again. And uh, what I'm going to propose and, and we've proposed before is that this is solved by uh, an incremental grouping operation where all those image elements that belong together are labeled with enhanced neural activity. Psychologists call it object-based attention, okay? Now this is uh, the first thing that happens if you present a new stimulus. So there's fast feed-forward processing. Information in the cortex starts in V1 and then ascends. Here is your prefrontal cortex. And as, as the information propagates, uh, the features start very simple and then go up to object category, well modeled now by these feed-forward deep neural networks. But that's not all. So there is a later phase where feedback and lateral connections come into play, allowing for recirculation of activity, and that is where we think this labeling operation takes place. And we'll see some evidence for that. Okay, now about awareness. And so I'm trying to introduce some of, of the concepts today by inviting you to be participants in, uh, in some very simple experiments. So I'd like you to remember this number, just store it. And now I'm going to present very weak stimuli. I'm going to present the stimulus about here. And uh, if you see it, just raise your hand. If you don't see it, don't raise your hand. So one, two, three. Yeah, yeah very good. Okay, now I'm going to make it more difficult for the careful viewers. One, two, three. Did somebody see it? No, okay. Another try, one, two, three. No, well, I don't control the contrast of this monitor. <laughs> to be honest, there was only one, st uh, one stimulus in the first and in the third attempt, but the third one was only on my screen and <laughs> not on this projector. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and what happens sometimes, depending on the audience, uh, uh, people, of course, may report that they see a stimulus that is not there, but that's nothing to be ashamed of. That's just how psychophysics works. Right, so, and that is nice because for each and every one of us, there, there will be a contrast level where you sometimes see it and you sometimes don't see it. And that is exploited if you do an experiment on consciousness because you can present the very same physical stimulus, sometimes see what happens in the brain when it's being reported and when it's not being reported. So you can compare that very clean, in a very clean manner. So that's uh, what we set out to do. And uh, this is uh, uh, based, actually our, our results were well described by a theory that psychologists use, it's called the signal detection theory. And it proposes that if you present the stimulus, say weak stimulus, you get across trials a, a, a distribution of what they call internal signal strength. And if there's no stimulus, there is another distribution, of course, shifted to the left because on average the internal signal strength is lower. And on a spe specific trial, you would be sampling from this distribution. So you might have this internal signal strength. And in the signal, signal detection theory, there's a threshold. And if the internal signal is stronger than the threshold, you're so going to say, yes, I saw it. It's called a hit. But due to the noise in the system, it may happen that for the very same stimulus, you kind of say no because it, the signal stays below. Now, if there is no stimulus, you're going to sample from the other distribution. So typically, it will stay below the threshold. So you say no, and it's correct rejection. 
And occasionally also because of the noise, it may happen that it goes above the threshold. So you will say yes, but there was no stimulus and that's called a, a false alarm. Now, if you have a stronger stimulus, then the green distribution shifts to the right. Now it might be a good idea to shift your threshold. So because you're now having much fewer false alarms, but if you apply this threshold, of course, to the weak stimulus, you're going to have a lot of misses. So there's this trade-off between the number of misses, the number of false alarms, and probably also how bad it is to make a miss and how bad it is to have a false alarm. So what we asked in this study is, where is this internal representation of signal strength in the brain? What causes the variability, so the width of these distributions, and what is this threshold? And um, when we got the results, it turned out that we were supporting Stan de Haines, uh, uh, global neuronal workspace theory. And I'm just giving you the flavor of it. So it, it suggests that if you present the stimulus, say weak stimulus, it's first propagated to prefrontal cortex. Now here something happens that Stan called ignition and it causes a self-stabilized activity pattern such that if you now take the stimulus away, there's still a trace of the fact that you saw a stimulus, a working memory, so to say. And you can report it. Now, if on some trials the stimulus is not propagated very efficiently, you would not get ignition, so you would get a miss. And on those trials where the very same stimulus is propagated more strongly, you would get ignition and it would cause a hit. That's, that's the, the logic of the experiment. <clears throat> and we trained monkeys to do this very same task. So on 50% of trials, there was a stimulus, it was a gray disc. And if there was a brief delay and then the monkey reported seeing the stimulus by making an eye movement towards its uh, memorized location. So this is probably one of the tasks where rhesus monkeys are useful. I, I just learned from, from Stefan that this is difficult for marmosets. Um, and then on those trials, these 50% of trials without a the stimulus, then the animal reported not seeing a stimulus by making this eye movement to the reject dot that was always there. Now, if you vary the contrast of the stimulus, of course, the performance changes. So if it's a high contrast, the animal always reports it. If it's low contrast, he, uh, he doesn't report it very often. And so we, for the analysis, we put two thresholds. We said that if the accuracy is better than 80%, that's clearly an easy stimulus. If it's lower than 40%, it's difficult. And then you have uh, also contrasts that are in between. We recorded from V1, V4, and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And I was very surprised when we saw the results because in V1, when we present the same stimulus, we can already to some degree predict whether it's going to reach consciousness or not. That's what you see here. So in green are stimuli with weak contrast, so with difficult trials that are going to make it into consciousness and in, in red, those that are not. But we made sure that in this comparison, the contrast levels were the same. Okay, so apparently there's already variability between the eye and V1. And if, of course, activity in V1 is stronger, probability that this gets propagated, maybe to prefrontal cortex, is going to be higher. And you we saw the same effects for the intermediate difficulty and also to some degree for the easy stimuli. And what is interesting here is that the easy missed trials even reached more activity than the difficult scene trials. So having a certain level of activity in V1 is no guarantee that this stimulus will reach conscious awareness. We got the same results in V4. And in frontal, or dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, including frontal eye fields, we saw this bistable activity pattern. Whenever the animal is going to report the stimulus, we get a high activity. And whenever the animal was not going to report stimulus, it was a, a low activity. Um, now I should uh, point out a caveat. We are recording here from an eye movement structure. So it includes the frontal eye fields. So we're here not dissociating the plan to make an eye movement from the conscious percept itself, if it, if it exists somewhere in the brain, right? Probably it does, but we are not claiming that we can dissociate it in this experiment. Um, so of course, this is a region where you can put a threshold between the seen and the not seen stimuli, which is not possible for the other structures. We also looked at uh, those trials without a stimulus, and if the animal correctly reported not seeing anything, activity was universally low, that's the black curves. And if he reported the stimulus that was not there, only on four or five percent of trials, you see this ramping of activity, but we actually believe that, we can't prove it here, but we believe that this could be more abrupt, but it happens at different time points in different trials, and if you then do the average, you see this slow ramping. Okay, so. 
of these three areas, if there is one that conforms with this internal representation of signal strength, then it's going to be the prefrontal cortex, right? Because activity is low whenever the animal is going to report it, so blue and, and green, and uh, it's weaker when the animal uh, fails to see the stimulus or has a correct rejection. Okay, so based on this, quite in, in, uh, in alignment with, uh, with the conference title, one would, one would think that, um, oops, I'm going too fast now. One would think that it's really the prefrontal cortex that matters and also quite uh, compatible with Stan's models. And um, oh, he, he, he published a model um, oh, in, uh, in 2005 already that proposed that it's really the degree to which stimuli get propagated to the place where ignition occurs that matters. Now, I presented this data to Stan a couple of years ago, and he said, oh, okay, I can make an even better model. And I will make it very simple. And he said, you know, I'm going to make a model of five neurons. Okay, so you have now five neurons that, uh, that are kind of modeling the entire brain. One neuron in the LGN, one in V1, the feed forward connections. And if you then present the stimulus, so it starts in the LGN, it propagates to higher areas. And you see there are these feedback connections and these self-connections. And in the model, the Self-connections and, and feedback connections are particularly strong between parietal and frontal cortex, so that if a certain activity level is reached, it can self-sustain. Okay, so that, that is then what uh, one might think of as ignition, sort of a memory trace of a stimulus that was presented before. Um, now, if you now take the stimulus away, the, the activity stays in the network, so there will be a hit. Now, due to the stochasticity of these, these neurons, what can happen if the activity gets propagated, but it stays below the level for self-sustained activity. And if you then take the stimulus away, activity in the network collapses. Okay, it's a very simple model. It will be a miss. <coughs> and this shows you the data from the model. Um, so you see this difference between seen and miss stimuli, even at the level of V1. Of course, if there's a high activity in V1, there's a high probability that it will reach also these, these levels where this ignition can occur. Same in V4, and in dorsal lateral or in frontal cortex, it's called here, there is this uh, bistable activity pattern. Um, and also in this uh, model, we looked at those trials in which there are these sort of spontaneous ignitions. So the, the model reports a stimulus that was not there. That happens, of course, because of the stochasticity. It can happen then that just due to the noise in frontal cortex, activity crosses the boundary for self-sustained activity, and then it just will stay high from, from that moment onward. So that's what you see here. And in the model, we can check it, and it did, indeed happens quite rapidly, but at different time points in different trials. Okay. Now, this is what Stan modeled, I think, on a rainy Sunday afternoon. This is hard work in the lab, four years, three PhD students. So if you still have the possibility to choose a career. <laughs> OK, so just some, some interim conclusions. So what we see here is that the variations in internal signal strength across trials, they're probably explained by the efficacy of feed-forward processing and the noise in the system. The threshold for perception in the model, and I think it gives a quite a good account of the data, is the threshold for producing this self-sustained activity. You can think of it as a working memory. And these false alarms happen occasionally, maybe on four or five percent of trials, and they are these spontaneous ignitions. Okay, so now, based on what I've told you, you would now maybe think, okay, so it's really prefrontal cortex that is the champion of consciousness. And I don't think that's true. So I would like to argue now from now on that in some cases it's also early visual cortex that is important for consciousness, but not for these simple contrast detection tasks. And so what I'm going to do, and this is the next experiment, so I'm going to present to you very briefly a stimulus and just try to see what is there, okay? Some of you may have seen the stimulus, then don't spoil it for the others. So one, two, three. Did you see it? Did you recognize it? What did you see? Sorry? A bird, yeah, yeah. So um, this is the stimulus. And many people, and I can control that, of course, see kind of stuff, right? Maybe brown, green, maybe wood chips, things like that. 
And it takes a little bit more time before you see the bird because it relies on the segregation of all these image elements from the background. Okay, so, and that is what I talked about. This is a late recurrent processing phase where the visual brain starts to highlight all those image elements that need to be grouped in perception. And psychologists call this object-based attention. I think philosophers of consciousness call this access awareness. Okay, so, it's the thing that, that you would direct attention to and that for which you bind all the features into a coherent percept. There's another form of, uh, of awareness, and not everybody agrees on it, but some call it phenomenal awareness, that is, there's all the other stuff that you see, but don't direct attention to. My, my provisional definition is all the stuff that you could attend to if you wanted to, but you're not doing it. Okay, now if you then say switch your attention to the stick, then of course that goes into access awareness. <laughs> and the bird would go into phenomenal awareness. So that's the idea, and, and now I'm going to present some data in accordance with this, with this view, and this is based on the work also from a good colleague of mine, Victor Lamme, with whom I did a lot of work together. So what you see here is also several image elements that together form a figure on the background. And Victor showed many years back that if a V1 receptive field falls on the figure, you get more activity than if it falls on the background. Now, what happens first is there's feed forward information from the eye, that's the peak that does not discriminate between the two situations. Then the information is sent to high areas that start to feedback to V1, and then you get this response enhancement. Okay, now Victor showed also quite a number of years ago that if animals, monkeys, have to do figure ground segregation, make an eye movement to this square figure, sometimes they don't see it. If they do see it, you get the peak response and then this difference response, or figure ground modulation, we call it. And he showed that if the animal fails to see the figure, he probably saw the image elements, but he failed to see the figure, then you get the visual response, but you just don't get this response modulation. Okay, so suggesting that this late phase, in some cases, like figure ground, is important for conscious awareness of the figure. So we, we have seen this in monkeys, We've seen the same signal in, in humans. So here we have the, we have the uh, yeah, rare occasion where we could record from neurons uh, with a person with epilepsy, and then, then we have these uh, so-called bain graffit electrodes. So this is spiking activity from the human cortex for figuring ground. But for the purposes of what I want to tell you, it, it, this also works in mice. So in the mouse in V1, you see that the figures elicit more activity than the background. And this is very convenient because now we can use the powerful tools that that are at our disposal to manipulate uh, brain activity in, in mice. <clears throat> this is the work of Lisa Kirchberger. And what she did is she did uh, optogenetic silencing of, of area V1, basically erasing all the spikes from V1. And the uh, mice were doing here a figure ground task. So there was either a figure ground stimulus with a figure on the left, the mouse licks uh, left lick spout, and on the right, the mouse licks uh, right lick spout. And then she did silencing, so she knocked out all V1 activity. Or, and that is nice about optogenetics because it's temporally very precise, you can let through the feed forward response, but only and selectively knock out this late phase where this figure ground modulation occurs, or let through of that, uh, some of that activity as well. Okay, now I, I don't have time to show you the raw data, but basically what, what she found is that if you knock out all activity, well, the mouse is largely blind. So he cannot do figure ground, but he can also not do simple contrast perception of the sort that I've been talking in the beginning about. Now, if you let through the feed forward response, but you knock out the figure ground modulation phase, then the mouse can do contrast detection fine, but it's selectively impaired in figure ground. It cannot do figure ground. And only if you let through more of this late phase where this figure ground modulation occurs, only then the mouse can do figure ground. Okay, so, and, and from previous studies, we know that this, this late figure ground activity also depends on where you direct your attention. Stronger if you direct your attention to a stimulus. Right, so I would now like to argue that if you talk about the interactions between brain areas through a global neuronal workspace, the thing that has probably going to be exchanged between those brain areas are what I call selection signals. So frontal cortex might select something at a specific spatial location and then all the, all the elementary features of that object are actually highlighted in the primary visual cortex. Okay? And um, so I would like now to argue then 
that there are sort of three sorts of things that you can have related to uh, consciousness. So something can be in excess awareness, that's the stuff that we attend. Something can be in phenomenal awareness, that's the stuff that is there. We could attend if we wanted to. And, but not everybody agrees on this terminology. So uh, this phenomenal awareness, so some, sometimes it's called pre-consciousness. Now this is, these are the philosophers of awareness, right? So <laughs> they like to fight, <laughs> and, and they do. <clears throat> so, and of course you have the stuff that is outside awareness. Uh, and I would think like the, the weak stimulus that gave rise to some neural activity but was just failed to be uh, reported, that would be outside awareness. Okay, now this is what I'd like to show you as a task that many of you might know. This is a so-called Raven's matrices. It's sometimes part of intelligence tests. So now the task is to, to predict what is, what is missing here in this, in this square. I guess you've, you've seen this task, right? So probably you'll find yourself uh, directing your attention maybe to circles, to squares, to different locations, trying to find a pattern. And what I, want to what, what I, why I present this uh, picture is I would like to illustrate what's happening here in your brain. You're focusing on some stuff that gets into your excess awareness. You're pushing back other things that you think are not so relevant, but then Maybe you register at some point that there are too few circles, so then maybe you think that the circle should be here and then you focus yet on something else to find out what should be up here, and so on and so forth. So things kind of go into your attention and out of your attention while you're thinking about this stimulus. Okay, so that's the idea. And, and what I think what's going on here that if you, for instance, are interested in circles, there might be a brain region that selects the circles and then highlights all the other features of those circles, say the spatial configuration in other brain areas. And that is, I think, what the global neuronal workspace is about. Okay, now this is about when you see the stimulus, and I would like to argue that you, we play the same game when the stimulus is no longer there, it's in your memory. So there, I would like now to invite you to remember the number that I presented in the beginning. Do you? Yeah, 127. So where was that number, right? in your brain, but where was it? We don't know, right? It's a big question. So I would like to argue at, at some stage it was probably when you were looking at the number, it was in excess consciousness, then it kind of faded away. I don't know where the boundary is, right? I don't know at some point, you might not want to call it phenomenal awareness anymore, but at least you can recall it. So there you can have the same game. So there are things in memory that you're really actively thinking about, probably also exchanging information between different brain areas. So that it will be attended within working memory. Something can be on the back burner, it's still in your memory, but you're not using it right now. So that is what sometimes is called accessory memory. And another example is iconic memory. I say a few words about that. And of course it can be lost if you forgot the number. So now I would like to review an experiment by, by George Sperling, very famous experiment. So what I'm going to do and what he did, he presented 12 items here, let, letters and digits. I'm only go, going to present it very briefly. Try to remember as many as you can. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> yeah, so people typically only remember three or four items. And uh, that is sort of the capacity of our working memory. But Sperling did also an, an interesting uh, version of it in which he cued, so it was this again, and then he cued one of those rows, and, and a high tone would mean that the subjects report the upper row, middle, uh, middle pitch, the middle row, and the lower pitch, the low row. And what he then found is that subjects are actually quite able to report all the numbers on, and, and digits <laughs> and letters on the, on the row that he queued. And uh, that's interesting because the queue came after the stimulus. So apparently all 12 items are somewhere in your memory between the stimulus and the queue, and then they fade away, and you have a little limited time to capture a few of them by attention. And in a paper that we published uh, two years ago, we demonstrated that the capacity and, and the, the temporal properties of this uh, so-called iconic memory matches very well with the decaying time course of V1 activity. So in V1, if you present a brief stimulus, neurons go up, and then it gradually ramp down again. And it turns out that the area under this curve is quite a good predictor for the properties of iconic memory. Okay? So now, in the last three minutes, two minutes, 
I would like to give you another example of, of things going between access consciousness and, and phenomenal awareness. And this is based on a study that uh, Doris Dijksterhuis carried out in the lab. So this is done in, now in humans. And these humans, they have a, an electrode in, um, in the hippocampus. And through those, we can record single units. So this is where the famous Jennifer Aniston cell was recorded, right? So we're using the same methodology here. And the subjects are reading a sentence, basically one concept at a time. So the first concept is Barack Obama and Jennifer Aniston sat in a bar. <coughs> and then there is a pronoun, he or she ordered a beer. Okay, now we record them from these so-called concept cells, and some of them also respond to the words that describe the concepts. And this shows you, this is actually decoding, but let's, let's to make it simple to understand, assume that this is a cell that responds to Barack Obama. Now Barack Obama can happen at the first location or at the second location. So if it happens at the first location, then activity peaks here. If it happens at the second location, activity peaks a little bit later, right, at the third word. And, um, and you see that, so here's Barack, and then here's Jennifer, so Barack goes down again. Maybe it's not completely silent here. And now it becomes interesting, because now you have the pronoun. Now he refers to Barack. What will happen? Well, what you see is that the concept reactivates. Okay, and that doesn't happen if, if the word she is presented, because it refers to Jennifer. And it does also does not happen if Barack would be replaced by another male person. Then the, the cell does not reactivate. So what I would like to argue here is that what you're seeing here is that when you hear about Barack Obama, it's in your access consciousness. Then Jennifer comes along. So maybe it becomes part of phenomenal awareness, but still kind of part of the context and graspable. And then the word he comes, and then it's kind of promoted again into access consciousness. So these are the kinds of games that happen when you read such a sentence. Okay, so I think this is quite consistent with, with this idea that you have three states. One is actually outside consciousness, one that is well, some philosophers of attention we like to call phenomenal awareness, and the other thing that the stuff that is attended that could be part of your access consciousness and this is a picture from Stan's paper on the global neuronal workspace okay so i'll finish by stating who did the work so this the heroic phd students are brown bruno and Dev. and together was, this was done with Stan. so this is the figure ground task with a important role for lisa but also matt self and the study on, on, on verbs was done by Doris Dijksterhuis together with uh, Judith, Matt, and also in collaboration with Stan. Thank you very much.